The first type of bonding we're going to look at in molecular orbital theory is the so-called sigma bond. Here we have a representation of a sigma bond, for example, between a 1s orbital on one atom and a 1s orbital on another atom. This is a typical way that we would represent uh, a sigma bond. Generally, we represent a, a 1s, 2s, 3s orbital simply as a circle, so it's a schematic. Uh, we're meant to interpret that as a region of electron density here, a region of electron density around this particular nucleus, and that there's an overlap between these two. And in this overlap region, almost like a Venn diagram here, we have an increase in electron density. It's this increase in electron density that actually holds the two atoms together in a bond. And we use the symbol of sigma for this type of a bond. Now notice, we have it in such a way that both of these circles are open, like white. So since they have the same color, we interpret them as being the same phase. Now one way to recognize that we actually have a sigma bond is, we notice that we have this overlap region here. If we go from one nucleus to the other and we draw a line, we notice that the line goes through the overlap region. When that's true, we have a sigma bond. Now, one of the other possibilities we can have with two 1s orbitals is we can have it where the two 1s orbitals have a different phase. Here, just to make it more colorful, we've made the two phases in two completely different colors. One is in blue and one is in red. We can interpret one as being a positive phase, the other as being a negative phase. <clears throat> when we have this type of bond, there's two different phases. Again, we have a sigma bond, but it's a sigma antibody. So one of the things, if we drew it the same sort of way we did here, in this region where we have overlap between the two orbitals, when we have a sigma antibonding orbital, we have a decrease in electron density. So if we have a bond where we have an increase in electron density in the overlap region, that's a bonding orbital. If we have a decrease in electron density in that overlap region, we have an antibonding orbital. If we don't have any change at all in the electron density, we have a non-bonding orbital or essentially no bonding at all. Now, the typical way, this is more colorful, the typical way that we would see this written in a book, particularly in an older book, would be as follows. So we write one, it would be a open circle and the other will be a filled circle. And this is, conveys the same information that this particular diagram did here. That we have two 1s orbitals or two s orbitals and that they have a different phase. So this would give us an antibonding orbital. Not only can we have sigma bonds between two different s orbitals, we can have other combinations. So for example, here we have an s orbital on one atom and a p orbital on the other atom. And the important thing here is that this particular p orbital is pointed towards the s orbital over here. So the, the region we're interested in determining whether it's bonding or antibonding is the region where these would overlap. So that's where this one comes up against this one. And we see that this is open. This one is open. So they have the same phase. So that makes this a sigma bonding orbital. On the other hand, if we reverse the phases on the p orbital, so now that the filled end is closer to the open end here, since these two have different phases, this gives us a sigma antibonding orbital. Again, we can a little bit more complicated, particularly when we start talking about uh, compounds of carbon. We can have a p orbital on one atom and a p orbital on the other hand, atom that will interact for a to make a sigma bond. Notice that we have an open area here, an open area here. That's where they're going to overlap, right next to each other. So that gives us a sigma bonding orbital. On the other hand, if we reverse the phases here, we see that the filled part is next to the open part here. And that gives us a sigma antibonding orbital. One thing to keep in mind is the nucleus for an s orbital will be at the center of the circle. The nucleus for a p orbital will be right at this sort of crossover point of the figure eight. We can also have sigma bonds formed between a d orbital on one atom and an s orbital on another atom. 
this type of bonding will be important in transition metal complexes, for example. So if we have a dz squared orbital, and it has to be oriented in this particular direction, with a s, uh, s orbital on a ligand, since this lobe and this orbital have the same phase, that will give us a sigma bonding interaction. On the other hand, this lobe of dz squared is positive phase, whereas this is negative phase here, so since they have opposite phases, this will give us a sigma anti-bonding orbital. Not only can we have this type of interaction with dz squared, we can also have this type of interaction with dx squared minus y squared. So this particular lobe is going to overlap with the s orbital. Since they have the same phase, they're both open, that gives us a sigma bonding orbital. On the other hand, if we have the dx squared minus y squared orbital, this has positive phase, but the s orbital has a negative phase, that will give us a sigma antibonding orbital. Now these, recall, these are the two orbitals that will form the EG combination when we have an octahedral complex. Here we want to take a look at sigma bonding between a d orbital on one atom and a p orbital on the other. Now, if you compare this to the previous slide, you'll notice that I've drawn the p orbitals slightly differently than I had before. Typically, I've drawn them as a figure eight. Here, I've drawn them almost as two circles to kind of emphasize the similarities between a p orbital and just putting two s orbitals right next to each other that are anti-bonding. That's entirely intentional because while the exact mathematics of the electron density aren't the same, the general orbital patterns will be exactly the same. So if we have a bond between this lobe of the d orbital and this lobe of the p orbital, of a, a s orbital, uh, yeah, p orbital, sorry, p orbital, um, that will be a bonding interaction. That will be no different than if this were an s orbital and another s orbital over here that were in an anti-bonding combination. It will make any difference at all. So the important thing is for us here is the sigma bonding interaction is between this lobe and that lobe of the p orbital, if we're talking about p orbital, or between that s orbital of an s uh, sigma anti-bonding combination on a particular uh, species that's over here. By the same token, we could have a p orbital where the negative phase is oriented towards the positive phase of the d orbital. Since this is positive, that is negative, we have a sigma antibonding combination. But it would be the same thing as if this were a sigma antibonding orbital itself between two different s orbitals, and then they as a unit were interacting with a d orbital here. It would make no difference. Again, it would be sigma antibonding between this lobe here and this lobe there. We can do the same exact thing with the d x squared minus y squared. Let's imagine this to be a p orbital, and the positive phase of the p orbital is oriented towards the positive phase of this d x squared minus y squared orbital. Since this is positive and that is positive, we have a sigma bonding interaction. And then just kind of continue with the p uh, species here. If this is a p orbital with a negative phase pointed towards the positive phase, of this d orbital, that will give us a sigma antibonding interaction between the p orbital here and the d orbital there. But we could just as well imagine that it worked the same if this were a sigma antibonding combination on a ligand and this were a dx squared minus y squared orbital on the metal. Again, this would be, since this has a different phase than this does, that would be a sigma antibonding interaction as well.